by Rian Amilcar Scott, featuring the profile of a young black man in glasses and a goatee, leaning from the left side of the frame with his arms outstretched in front of him and hands resting on a wall. Available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library, plus receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background, featuring images of the same book jackets as the previous slide with the Simply E logo. Borrow Wandering in Strange Lands and the World Doesn't Require You for free with a New York Public Library card available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background, also featuring book jacket images from the previous slide. These titles and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background, recommended reading. We also recommend these titles for further reading. Making Our Way Home, The Great Migration and the Black American Dream by Blair Imani. All Aunt Hagar's Children by Edward P. Jones. The Black Calhouns by Gail Lumet Buckley. The Twelve Tribes of Hattie by Ayana Mathis. And The Warmth of Other Suns, The Epic Story of America's Great Migration by Isabel Wilkerson. Check out these titles and more on Simply E, accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on white background, live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents Wandering in Strange Lands, Morgan Jerkins with Rian Amilcar Scott, August 25th, 2020 at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Black text on a white background. This slide features the book jackets for both speakers' books. The first, Wandering in Strange Lands, A Daughter of the Great Migration Reclaims Her Roots by Morgan Jerkins in white text on a terracotta brown background with abstract colorful landscapes overlaid in blue, light brown, yellow, and green. The second book jacket, black text on a light gray background, The World Doesn't Require You, stories by Rian Amilcar Scott featuring the profile of a young black man in glasses and a goatee, leaning from the left side of the frame with his arms outstretched in front of him and hands resting on a wall. Available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library, plus receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background, featuring images of the same book jackets as the previous slide with the Simply E logo. Borrow Wandering in Strange Lands and the World Doesn't Require You for free with a New York Public Library card, available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background, also featuring book jacket images from the previous slide. These titles and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background, recommended reading. We also recommend these titles for further reading. Making Our Way Home, The Great Migration and the Black American Dream by Blair Imani. All Aunt Hagar's Children by Edward P. Jones. The Black Calhouns by Gail Lumet Buckley. The Twelve Tribes of Hattie by Ayana Mathis. And The Warmth of Other Suns, The Epic Story of America's Great Migration by Isabel Wilkerson. Check out these titles and more on Simply E, accessible formats available through 
nypl.org slash talking books. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on white background, live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents Wandering in Strange Lands, Morgan Jerkins with Rian Amilkar Scott, August 25th, 2020 at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Black text on a white background. This slide features the book jackets for both speakers' books. The first, Wandering in Strange Lands, A Daughter of the Great Migration Reclaims Her Roots by Morgan Jerkins in white text on a terracotta brown background with abstract colorful landscapes overlaid in blue, light brown, yellow, and green. The second book jacket, black text on a light gray background, The World Doesn't Require You, Stories by Rian Amilcar Scott, featuring the profile of a young black man in glasses and a goatee, leaning from the left side of the frame with his arms outstretched in front of him and hands resting on a wall. Available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org slash shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library, plus receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background, featuring images of the same book jackets as the previous slide with the Simply E logo. Borrow Wandering in Strange Lands and The World Doesn't Require You for free with the New York Public Library card, available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background, also featuring book jacket images from the previous slide. These titles and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background, recommended reading. We also recommend these titles for further reading. Making Our Way Home, The Great Migration and the Black American Dream by Blair Imani. All Aunt Hagar's Children, by Edward P. Jones, The Black Calhouns by Gail Lumet Buckley, The Twelve Tribes of Hattie by Ayana Mathis, and The Warmth of Other Suns, The Epic Story of America's Great Migration by Isabel Wilkerson. Check out these titles and more on Simply E, accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Thank you for joining us tonight. We are currently playing our pre-event slideshow. Gold text on white background, live from NYPL logo. Live from NYPL presents Wandering in Strange Lands, Morgan Jerkins with Rian Amilcar Scott, August 25th, 2020 at 8 p.m. Eastern time. Black text, on a white background. This slide features the book jackets for both speakers' books. The first, Wandering in Strange Lands, A Daughter of the Great Migration Reclaims Her Roots by Morgan Jerkins in white text on a terracotta brown background with abstract colorful landscapes overlaid in blue, light brown, yellow, and green. The second book jacket, black text on a light gray background, The World Doesn't Require You, stories by Rian Amilcar Scott, featuring the profile of a young black man in glasses and a goatee, leaning from the left side of the frame with his arms outstretched in front of him and hands resting on a wall. Available for purchase online from the library shop, nypl.org slash shop. All proceeds benefit the New York Public Library, plus receive a free commemorative 125th anniversary tote bag with your purchase. Black text on a white background, featuring images of the same book jackets as the previous slide with the Simply E logo. Borrow Wandering in Strange Lands and The World Doesn't Require You for free with the New York Public Library card 
available through Simply E on iOS and Android. Black text on a white background, also featuring book jacket images from the previous slide. These titles and more are available in accessible formats for community members who do not use standard print. Find out more at nypl.org slash talking books. Black text on a white background, recommended reading. We also recommend these titles for further reading. Making Our Way Home, The Great Migration and the Black American Dream by Blair Imani. All Aunt Hagar's Children by Edward P. Jones. The Black Calhouns by Gail Lumet Buckley. The Twelve Tribes of Hattie by Ayana Mathis. And The Warmth of Other Suns, The Epic Story of America's Great Migration by Isabel Wilkerson. Check out these titles and more on Simply E, accessible formats available through nypl.org slash talking books. Forgive me. Hello. Thank you so much for being with us here tonight in the internet. Uh, my name is Aidan Flax Clark. I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs at the New York Public Library. And I have the distinct pleasure of getting to introduce two writers who I admire so tremendously, Rihanna Milker Scott and Morgan Jerkins. Morgan's latest book, which was published earlier this month, is called Wandering in Strange Lands, A Daughter of the Great Migration Reclaims Her Roots. And Rion's most recent book, which is out in paperback today, is called The World Doesn't Require You, Stories. Um, I just love these books so much. Um, in a lot of ways, they're pretty wildly different, but they are both so singular, so beautifully written, and so captivating that they will hold on to you well past when you've closed them. Um, if you haven't had the pleasure to have read one or both of them, you can buy both Rion and Morgan's books at the library shop. That uh, URL is on.nypl.org slash shop live. That is again, on.nypl.org slash shop live. Um, the link also came in the reminder email that you received when you signed up for this program, and we'll put them in the chats in both Zoom and in YouTube. Um, before I bring Morgan and Rian on, which we're going to do in a second, um, just a couple of quick housekeeping items I have to share with you. First off, this event is being recorded, not you, only the event itself, which is to say what you see on screen. Um, also, if you have questions for Rian or Morgan, you can submit them at any time during the program um, in a number of ways. You can put them into the chat at the bottom of the Zoom app or the Q&A box rather. You can put them into the chat in YouTube uh, and you can also email publicprograms at nypl.org. They'll answer as many as they can at the end. Uh, Real-time captions are available for tonight's program via stream text. You can find the link also in the reminder email that you received when you signed up for the program. And we'll also put them in the chats in Zoom and in YouTube. Lastly, earlier this month, the New York Public Library opened up 30 locations across Manhattan, the Bronx, and Staten Island for in-person grab-and-go service. If you want to learn more about all of our services, both in-person and online, you can go to nypl.org connect to sign up for our newsletter, where you will also learn about many of the great programs we have coming up in the weeks and months ahead. That address again is nypl.org connect. All right, let us bring on Morgan Jerkins and Rian Amilkar Scott. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you doing? Oh, you know, great. I'm glad you're here. We're just so thrilled to have both of you. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Okay, I'm gonna hey, do <laughs> Okay. How you doing, Morgan? Good, how are you doing? I'm great, I'm great. All right, so we get, just get this thing started? Yeah, let's get into it. All right, so you want me to go? You want you gonna go? Well, um, you know, I, I was I was thinking uh, what, what Aiden said made me think about um, you know our books are you know they're they're, they're different you know a lot of you know superficial ways but um, you know we, we're both looking at um, identity and and place you know and how that and how that is you know that that shapes that that shapes history. Mm -hmm. um, 
and and I you know I really admire a lot of the a lot of what you did with the with the research and 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 the and the traveling and the and uh, so uh, can you talk a little bit about about how the, how it came how all that came together for you? Yeah, so it's gonna sound a little bit bizarre, but I think I'm gonna just use um the I'm gonna piggyback off of the two topics that you were talking about, which is identity and place. Um, I was in Magic Johnson Theater in Harlem, which is a very famous theater um, in 2017. And I was watching Get Out. And it was probably like the second day that it, that it was out. And I was there at night with a roommate of mine. And I remember the climactic scene. If any of you seen the climactic scene where Daniel Kaluuya's character has his hand wrapped around the white girl's throat as he's trying to get away. And all of a sudden a police car pulls up. Mm -hmm. And everybody in the theater collectively gasped. And I was just astounded. Sorry, that's my light. Um, <laughs> I was astounded because um, I never had an experience like that before in a movie theater. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not a native Harlemite. I've only been in Harlem for five years. And I know there were other people in the theater that were not native either, but we all had this sense of fear of mm -hmm. land and state violence. And so initially, I wanted to write a book about that, like the intergenerational fear and trauma. And I actually sold my book off of that. But when I started talking to scholars, black female scholars, um, their names are Carrie Greenidge and Kendra Field. They're based in Boston. They were like, oh, this is a migratory story. Mm. And that's when it started to expand. So that was pretty much the inspiration. It came from a, from a, a horror movie. <laughs> um, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I think I think there's a lot in there where, where you talk about the the the, the trauma. Um, for instance, the the fear of water. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of that a lot of that resonated. You know, so as you know, uh, and you know, a, a lot of the uh, a lot of the things that that we think of, you know, uh, that that pass down. You know, the sort of the inheritances we pass down um, throughout history. Um, are you know uh, you know inherent in your book and and I think a lot of a, a lot of what struck me is a, is about how complex identity is um, right right and I think you know I always used to think about Black American experience when you read like in mainstream discourse something like the Black American experience mm -hmm. and, and if you're online you know Black people aren't a monolith that's such a catchphrase and it's true. But it's one thing to hear that, discuss it within your social circle, which if we're going to be real, I'm going to be real. Most of the people in my circle that are discussion, discussing that, they're college educated. They either are from the North or they migrated to the North. And they're pretty, they're, they're, they're privileged as far as their networks. So it's one thing to hear that. It's another thing to actually travel and to put your foot on a soil in a place where you don't know anybody and people don't know you. And even though you're black, you don't have the same experience. Like, like there's unifying forces, of course, with regards to displacement and discrimination, but still very distinct depending on where you go. Right, mm -hmm. right. Um, and I was thinking about your book because, um, you know, in your short stories, which I mean, I wish I could write short stories. I wish that I could just make them compact. And one of the things that you you have this location that comes up all the time, which is Cross River. And I wanted you to talk a little bit about that because, you know, I was doing some research. I was like, wait a minute, is Cross River like a, diff a certain type of place? Like, what is this place? Because what you do in your short story collection that I love is it, it's, 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 it's magical realists, but I wanna be delicate in saying that because at the same time, it's like, it, it almost feels like the spiritualness and, and the corporal kind of merge mm. in a way that it just, it, it's, it's, it's something that I've been thinking about with regards to writing about black people, how I'm Pentecostal. If any of you don't know, I grew up Pentecostal. So we're very, it's a part, it's a Christian denomination that's very full of ecstasy, not the drug, the emotion, um, very, uh -huh. very superstitious. And so when I was reading your when I was reading your short stories, I was like, "There's the fantastic, but it's also very much real." 
And I wanted to ask, you know, just a, how did you craft that in a way? Like, I never felt like I was thrown out of the world and the world is part of your title. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, the, the poet Michael Collier said, said to me one time that my, um, my, my first book, uh, Insurrections, was like, um, was was like the bones and this was like and, and this book was it was like the spirit of the uh, of the town across river and i i i you know i i, I when he said that i kind of just stopped and was like whoa yeah that makes a lot of sense and um you know it's i feel like what i'm uh, what i'm writing you know i put the the uh i put the the fantastical right next to right next to the real uh, because I feel like that's how we 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 sort of experience uh, experience life. We experience you know life. With, you know, there's so much that we don't know and don't understand. Um, you know, uh, even with even within our history. You know, when I'm reading your book, I was thinking back through through history, and I think most of us um, don't know past a certain point. Especially especially when black people, we don't we don't know past a certain point. And um, and it you know it took a lot for all of us to you know for every single individual human being to to get here and and um and 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 that's what we and, and that's what we don't know so a lot of it you know speculative speculative the speculative genre is, is is perfect for me because i'm sort of um you know speculating on on uh, on histories that you know that we that i that we don't um that we don't understand you know uh, or don't know you know don't necessarily can't necessarily connect to um, you know, we have so many, we have so many traditions that, that are, that are almost, they're, they're almost like dead metaphors, you know, yeah. um, we follow these traditions without really knowing where they came from. Uh, and I, and I, and I really want to interrogate that a lot. Yeah. So for me, I think what really struck me about, um, what you talked about history is that when I spoke to people who are the descendants of enslaved Africans, and I'm purposely saying enslaved Africans it's enslaved black people rather than slaves, um, mm -hmm. you know, because you know, just to be respectful. Um, mm -hmm. But um, most people that I spoke to, they couldn't go past 1870, and the reason being is because of their ancestors being enslaved. They weren't counted in the census, right? So it was very hard. And for me, I love what you said about speculative because two things that happened when my book came out and they're aligned with each other. Someone from a paper um, reviewed my book. And one of the things that she said was she wished that I was more objective. Hmm. And it, it, it didn't hurt my feelings because right now we're living in the age of the protests, right? And we're talking about newsrooms how they write about a, a person, a slain black person's life. Um, what is objectivity, you know, in <laughs> regards to journalism? And it didn't bother me because I said to myself, the, the reviewer clearly missed the point because how could I, as a black American woman whose great grandparents fled the South because of racial terrorism, like millions of others, have an objective view to this type of book. How can mm -hmm. I start asking me to be distant in a way that's just completely inappropriate for this type of undertaking? And then sometimes I go on Goodreads, okay, maybe a lot, and I should, you know, you should because it's not, it's not for us as authors, but- It's a bad, bad decision. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm, I'm trying, I, I'm trying. I do stop. it too. <laughs> I'm trying. But one black woman, she said, I see that she has so many sources. It's almost as if she doesn't think that she'll be believed. Mm. And when she said that, I really wish I could reach across the screen and be like, you're right. You're so right. When I went down to the low country, um, visiting rice plantations, um, when I went to Louisiana and I learned about free people of color. When I went to Oklahoma to hear about black people in the, in the five so-called the five civilized tribes, every step of the way, I was like, somebody's not going to believe me. Mm. Somebody's not going to, if I don't take pictures now, if I don't find some type of source that can boost even the speculative educated guesses, 
people are going to say that I lied. And even when I went and did uh, interviews for the book, like I was on NPR and I was talking about a a famous rice plantation um, right near, right in the low country of Georgia. And I said that there's no historical marker for the enslaved people that worked there. And I was actually taken to that plantation by a descendant of those people. And I actually went on the website just to make sure I was sure. Mm. I knew that I was sure because I went there that day. I remember, <laughs> the, I remember the pictures. And it's like, it's this kind of gaslighting that I was already doing to myself because right. I already see how much black people aren't believed for less. So it, it definitely, it's something that I think about still, how one person who's a reviewer thought wanted me to be more objective. And I actually had that in mind, like try to be, try to just have as much source as you can. And another black person was like, anybody who listens and is in these parts knows that this is not a lie. Mm. And it's- hey, like, well, I I, I think your your book um you know, interrogates interrogates that and interrogates the um the insistence on on the on on documentation you know uh, as a superior um superior you know uh, a superior thing to uh, oral history yeah um, and uh, and you know and and you know particularly with your your section on on the the native the um, black black uh, connections with, with with the native with native american tribes and and native american um uh ancestry uh that that portion you know it shows the it, that in many ways the oral history uh has ha, you know has a superiority on uh on documentation which is the documentation is not is, is not objective it's um, not it's not i mean i'm gonna give you a prime example so if any of you follow me on twitter which is just morgan jerkins I am researching for a fourth, pro a fourth book, a fourth book project. And one of the things that I'm doing is looking at slave narratives. Mm -hmm. There's a slave narrative um, by a man named Lewis Hughes. And he worked on a large Mississippi plantation. And he said that every single day, an able-bodied slave have to, had, to, had to, do, had to uh, pick 250 pounds of cotton a day. And... I was talking to some people, some people were commenting like, oh, my parents were sharecroppers and these people are like in their forties. Wow. And I was like, okay. So one of the things that I've been doing during the pandemic, just to foster community, cause I live alone. I, I do this thing called like a black people roll call. And I do like a, I ask a question. And I asked the question, I said, how many of y'all or your parents have picked cotton? Like state your ages and where you're from. And one woman said, my mother and her relatives picked cotton in the late 70s. And when I went to Vanderbilt in the 90s, I told my professor and he told me that's not true and made me doubt all the stories I heard. Then he came back and apologized to me after he did his research. So imagine somebody who was a professor telling you that the oral histories that you had, that you literally heard from people who've done this is wrong. And then they have to come back and apologize to you. And imagine the professors that don't have that humility. And yeah, right. thinking that they're the ones that get their papers published. They're the ones that are getting invited to go on, you know, MSNBC and CNN. They're the ones that are presenting at these conferences. So it's 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 interesting because I will tell you an anecdote. I love these anecdotes, but like I when I first moved to Harlem, and this is a bizarre story, people never believe me, but one of my roommates was a white was a white gay Trump supporter. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I knew that he had some things with him before, <laughs> before, you know, the election, because I moved in 2015. Uh -huh. But every time we would talk, because he had a fascination with black people. He lived in Harlem for 10 years. And when I would tell him about my experience as a black woman, every time he would just be like, state your source, state your data. Where's the paper on this? As if me talking about it is not substantial enough. Mm. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely like, I think it, it's something I've just been thinking about in my work, but I'm also, I'm curious, like with regards to, you know, for your short story collection, like, did you look in any, did you do any type of historical research um, alongside with like, you know, reading other, other works from your inspirations? Um. You know, I'm, I'm always I'm always doing sort of sort of light research. Um, I, I you know I, I try not to try to not to go down uh, too much of a of a of a rabbit hole. 
um, which I'm, I'm doing right now for this novel that I'm writing. I'm, I'm way down a rabbit hole, but I, I, you know, with the stories, I try not to go down too much of a rabbit hole because, um, you know, I don't want to get into that thing where I sort of have to include every every single little thing that I that, that I find. You know, I want the stories to to to, to sort of sort of take precedent, and um, and then when I need to fill a hole, you know, that I, I fill a hole. Um, but um, you know, one thing I learned, you know, my town, this Cross River, was the history of it was it was founded after a slave revolt in 1807, um, and so I I um. You know, when I came up with this idea, um, you know, I wanted it said in 1807, uh, specifically uh, because that's 100 years before my grandmother was born, and you know, she she was in my life for the majority of my life, um, wow. uh, and and I and I wanted to honor her in that way. Um, she was she was actually alive at the time when I was coming up with this, and um, you know, and I wanted I wanted to be I wanted the the insurrection to be inspired uh, by the Haitian Revolution. Um, and so, you know, so I, so I, and, you know, I'm always doing sort of light research and I was connecting it, connecting it with that. What I found, what I found, um, and I'm, I mean, what I found is that they were just, you know, unimaginable amount of insurrections um, uh, throughout the, throughout the, the hemisphere uh, in, in this country, you know, uh, we, we, uh, we aren't, I think, I don't think most of us are taught the, the history of, of rebellion. Um, you know, we hear about Nat Turner, we hear about John Brown, but the history of rebellion is uh, it, it's extensive, um, and, and and you talk about that in your in your book. There's a uh, there's an insurrection there that I had never I had never come across, I had never heard of, and or, or knew or knew about. Um, so I've been doing a lot of research on on that um, for my for my upcoming works. Right, you know, I, I wanted to talk. I have two questions actually for you. So when you talk about insurrections, like we all know about the Haitian Revolution, uh, mm -hmm. we know about Nat Turner and John Brown. But I often, you know, sometimes I come across things online where people are just like, why couldn't Americans do what Haitians done? Right. And I think when you were talking about, no, there were a, a ton of insur insurrections that happened. And I don't know if you've come across that that sort of comparison within the diaspora. Well, um, well that's, that's sort of, that's along the lines of that t-shirt. You know, I, I'm not my... I'm not my ancestors, you know, uh, <laughs> or, you know, you can catch these hands, you know, yeah. um, you know, and yeah, I've seen that before, you know, I've seen that, that idea. Um, and, and, and I, I, that comes from, I think that comes from not knowing, you know, I think yeah. it comes from not knowing that there, that there were, you know, a, a, you know, plenty, plenty of attempts. Yeah. And the second question I wanted to ask you is regards to rabbit holes. So, me and you are working out of that tradition where like we look at historical research, but for me, like I do go down right holes. Like, mm -hmm. every and I wanted to talk a little bit about like the balance between knowing your stuff or your shit, excuse my language, and letting your imagination to be speculative and be okay with the ridges and the, and the nooks and crannies that you just don't know. Um, for me, it's like, you know, I'm researching right now um, about like Mississippi and I'm researching mm -hmm. about Texas at the, out, at, you know, the brink of the civil war. And I don't know nothing about that. And I'm just like <laughs> researching and like every time I had something like, okay, I need to research then. And I told myself, you know, at a certain point, you're going to have to write. Right. And you're going to revise, but you have to write. But a part of me is like, I don't want to go too soon because I feel like it's almost unethical in a way to yeah. just start painting all over the place and I don't know the intricacies of it. And, and so like I wanted to know like for you, like how do you balance that or it just depends on what each, you know, each story needs, each chapter needs, each scene needs, you know, so on and so forth. Yeah, I mean, I do think it, it, it the needs of the story um, are sort of paramount, but I, you know, I try to use history and I'm, I'm, I'm not a, uh, I try to use history like I use my personal experience, you know, um, I sort of live with it, um, cut it and remix it, you know, put it in there. Um, and, you know, when, and, and so that, and that, and that's, that's how I sort of, you know, I want to, I want to know it. I want to internalize it when I'm, when I'm doing the research, you know, um, and, you know, I want to read something and, and take notes on it and then forget about it, uh, you know, uh, put it to the side and then, and then, um, and then let it, let the story speak through and then pull what you need. Uh, yeah. and, and that's, that's sort of how I've been. And I, and I, you know, 
I, I, I talk about it better than I actually do it, you know, <laughs> um, right. because, you know, right now, I'm, you know, I'm writing this story and I'm like, I, you know, I don't know. It's like, I feel like it needs, it needs a lot, you know, and I'm in that, I'm in that phase where, I, where I'm reading, I'm reading, like, like, you, like you are reading a lot of slave narrative. Um, I'm reading a lot, I'm reading a lot of histories. Yeah, yeah. And so with regards to, you know, the world doesn't require you, um, your literary influences, because for me, when I read your book, I was like, I see Edward P. Jones just had the magic wand, just like blessing it. <laughs> um, they, they, if any of you, are, um, uh, if you any of you are not familiar with Edward P. Jones, um, you should be. Well, yes. Um, there is a there was a piece in the New York Times, I think, it was written by A. O. Scott about uh, his his uh, underappreciated nature. Um, he wrote on Hagar's children, all on Hagar's excuse me, all on Hagar's children. Um, he won the Pulitzer Prize. Um, I was introduced to his work in uh, the Bennington Writing Seminars, where I'm MFA, and I was working on a, a speculative story. Um, which then developed into a novel. I was trying to do a short story, but it did not. The mm -hmm. person right, who, who was my advisor was Alex Chi. And he was like, you need to read all Aunt Hagar's children. So when I read your book, I was like, oh man, I see the influences. And so I don't know if you had any others or you just want to speak about Edward P. Jones and how he's influenced your work, but feel free. You know, when I started, when I started writing, I knew that I was going to have a place that I was going to write um toward and i was going to keep going back to that place and you know i'm from the dc area so i was going to write about uh dc in the dc area and my characters were going to be there then i read edward p jones <laughs> and i was like all right ed got it you, you got it you you have you have dc because i knew i i didn't feel like i could write about it at the level that he wrote um so um so that's that's how i came up with with cross river um and i, th I think you know in my first book uh you know, there were there was there were several stories where you know where I I was you could tell that I was reading Edward P. Jones right before I sat down to write. You know, I think you know uh, you know a lot of honor um, you know uh, you know go go to him goes to him for me. Um, it's, it's just his sentence structure um, is, is is just mind bending. Uh, you, a, a lot of his sentence. Is, um, you know, they do this thing where they go forward, backward, um, mm -hmm. and sort of sideways in time. Um, and the sentences, you know, end up saying a whole lot more than what's actually on the page. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, so in, in terms of the story, particularly in my first book, that was, you know, it was, that was you know, something, someone I kept returning to. Yeah. Um, you know, I returned, returned to August Wilson a lot, um, you know, just the, again, the idea of, of a place that you that, that, that my characters are going to and coming in and out, um, you know, is something that I borrowed from from uh, August Wilson as well as as Gloria Naylor. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, and I think, and I, I with the there's a there's a in my the, my current book, my my latest book is a novella at the end. Um, and there's a character who lives who, who lives in he lives part time in a hole and part time in um, a school school of communications at a college, um, and he he you know he has sort of this you know sort of wild wide ranging uh, sort of highly intellectual voice, um, you know, but he's a fool at the same time. Uh, you know, what what that comes from is uh, you know is. I was, you know, for a long time after reading *Invisible Man*, everything I wrote was kind of like, you know, I, I borrowed, I borrowed from from Ralph Ellison. And at a certain point, I hadn't read *Invisible Man* for a while, and I felt like I was free of that influence. And then in my first book, um, I was teaching a class on *Invisible Man*, so it was time for me to go and read it again. And I was, you know, then I went back to my first book, and I was like, wow, look at all this that I took from *Invisible Man*. Even though I, I felt myself free, I thought I was free of the influence. So what I did with the second book was I was like, I'm gonna just gonna lean into that influence, you know, and and that's sort of sort of what I did in the in the novella. Oh, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, for me, like I would say, for my influences, of course, Zora Neale Hurston, mm -hmm. um, Even, and I yeah. was influenced by her because she kind of taught me that I don't have to be a distant observer with things. Like I don't have to take this cold, austere, um, journalistic approach. To writing about Black communities. Um, of course, like I think about Sadia Hartman, 
Um, mm -hmm. Sister Harmon is a recent uh, newly minted MacArthur genius. Um, she wrote Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experiments, where she writes about um, Black girls and women at the turn of the 20th century, not too far from slavery, you know, exploring, running buck wild, if you will. Um, and she's really into archival research, uh, the limits of it, what we can and cannot know. And she's been a huge influence on me as well but even just like like i mean i got inspiration from a jordan peele movie and i think it's, like, <laughs> right. it's always nice to have just like a melange of inspiration especially with black people because we just we you know artists they work in all different forms uh -huh. and because you know i needed a mosaic just like the united states of america i just tried to lean into that as best as i could even though it was tough and there were so many times where i had to get out of my own way I will say that with regards to the drafts and, you know, with the book just coming together in general. What do you mean by that? What is, which, which part? Getting out of your own way. What does that look like? Oh, I mean, so here's what we talk about with history, right? Like I tell people all the time, like when you said earlier about, I am not my ancestors. And sometimes it's used in a way to say, I'm different than them in a way that I'm stronger than them, which I think is completely uh, wrong because uh -huh. if our ancestors' survival wouldn't be here. But here's the thing about that survival. That survival may, may make you uncomfortable if you knew what that was, what the method was. And for me, I had to tell myself to not flatten the complexities of my ancestors. So for example, um, the way that I was taught Black history, I grew up, and I hope that people, when they read my book, they realize that the subtext is that public school systems suck, or maybe <laughs> the education system in America sucks. But Black history was taught to me very streamlined. It was like your ancestors were captured near or on the, co the west coast of Africa. They were brought over via the Atlantic Ocean because of the Middle Passage. You know, they were working in the colonies and you had, you know, the Civil War, Emancipation, Reconstruction, Harlem Renaissance, the Civil Rights, and then Barack Obama. There was nowhere in there that I was taught, for example, that there were free black people or free people of color before emancipation. Mm -hmm. I was never taught that there were black slave owners, thousands of them. Now, granted, some of them bought their family members with the purpose of manumitting or freeing them, but they, they were, were slave owners. I was also wasn't taught that if any of you are familiar with Trail of Tears, when Andrew Jackson forced five tribes, which are called the five civilized tribes, the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Seminole, and the Creek, when he forced them out of the South uh, across the Mississippi and in the Indian Territory, which is now known as Oklahoma, Black people were on that journey, whether mm -hmm. they were enslaved by them or they were a part of, or they were fugitives, you know, former slaves fleeing from rice plantations, for example. I was never taught that. So it was tough for me, for example, to write about the fact that yes, I had free people of color in my family who in fact, who were slave owners because I was taught in terms of America that when we think of white and black, they're on polar opposites with regards to uh, their cultural capital, their access to it, social capital and just actual capital. But when you realize that you've had ancestors who participate in the plantation economy, maybe not, obviously not the same progress and speed as white people, it complicates things. Mm -hmm. um, and so me, it was constantly trying to get out of my own way. Cause again, I'm on the internet and I know how ruthless people can be even when you show the facts with facts they don't like. And I, and it's, especially when I wrote the Louisiana section, of course, cause Louisiana, if any of you know about Louisiana history there, that's where, you know, you had the, you know different categorizations of people like Creole, black, and also again, um, these liaisons with, you know, white people and enslaved black women. And I, when I was writing about it, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get eaten alive for this. I am going to get eaten alive. But I was like, if I obfuscate these parts of history, then why am I even writing this book? Why am I doing all this travel in the first place? Like, mm -hmm. I'm completely, like you're completely unraveling what you're trying to thread. 
at the same time. So I had, that was a part of me getting out of my own way. I was writing because I was like, it was making me so uncomfortable to write <laughs> about that. I mean, I think it should. I, I, you know, I, I think history, you know, should. And you're, you know, there's a there's a tendency to sort of flatten, to sort of flatten the history, and you know, to to approach it with the with the simplicity. Um, you know, uh, you know, I, you know, reading your book of you know the the history of the uh, of Native Americans and 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 Black people and uh, and you know their Blacks were, were sort of, in, were, 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 many were enslaved with the Native American child. That complicates a lot of things. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it you know, I, I think, I think if, any, if anyone's reading this book and is, uh, and is not, um, not uncomfortable at certain points and they're not reading it, they're not reading it correctly. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot, there's a lot that as a reader that makes me, that, that, that made me, you know, uncomfortable, but it's, you know, it's, it's history. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was a lot. Also, you know, if any of you all have questions, audience members, please, you know, feel free to, you know, put them in the box. Um, we'll be responding to those shortly. Um, I want to change the, the, you know, the, the focus a little bit uh, because, you know, we don't live in a bubble and we're both Black writers. And, you know, you have, we have the paperback release of your book coming out, you know, in light of the pandemic and the protests and my book coming out. Um, my book was originally slated to come out May 12th. And it was very interesting because, you know, as I said earlier, um, I, I live alone. And for any of you who are, who live in New York or who lived in New York um, at the end of March going into April, you know how macabre it was living here. Like I don't live too far from Central Park and I didn't hear a dog bark. I didn't hear people on the street. I barely even heard the bus. Wow. All I heard every night was the sound of the ambulance sirens that even to this day still rattles me to think about what's gonna happen when winter comes. But anyways, I was trying to pull myself together and realize that all these routines that I had are just done for the time. Uh -huh. And it was interesting because I actually consulted a tarot reader because I was really nervous about my book. And I told her, you know, I was like, what does it say about my book? And she was looking at the car and she was like, I sense a delay, but everything's going to be okay. <laughs> literally, literally two or three hours after she said that, I get an email from my editor in the beginning of April asking if they could push it to August. So I was relieved because I just felt like I wasn't emotionally prepared to deal with it. And I'm usually an impatient person. Like, mm -hmm. I'm like, let's go. But I was like, no, push it back because I assumed, jokes on me, that everything would not be in lockdown anymore. Um, and because it's August, it's like a traveling book. You know, it's, you know, summer people be going places. Right. But then, then the protests happened, right? And that was just hard, I guess, on any person if they were paying attention. But, you know, I wanted to talk to you about this. I, I don't want to say resurgence because I do believe that we are in a golden period with black art, mm -hmm. but this, uh, this renewal in coverage of reading black authors and all of these anti-racist lists that are coming out. Um, and I wanted to get your opinion on that in terms of like its usefulness, um, its futility rather, or rather, or just like the endurance of that, the takeaway. Like just you know, just riffing. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I see these lists, and I, I think we've we've both been you know, I've seen both of our books on on these on these lists. Um, I, I mean, of course, knowledge and, and understanding, and you know, and, and getting that from books, books books change lives on a, on an individual basis. Um, and, and I, I I'm grateful for that. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, I'm I'm concerned that. Um, I'm concerned that white America might uh, is looking at is looking at us, looking at us and our books, um, and 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 substituting um, substituting the, the reading for um, figuring out how to make real engagement and, and change. You know, the reading should be a precursor um, to something. You know, yeah. and it's like after we make these lists, what do we do? <laughs> what what, do you, what are you doing with that information? Um, right. Right. And you know, it's it, you know, it's, I, I just 
I mean, it feels it. it, it yeah, again, I'm grateful to, to that people are, are are looking at my book and you know and, and you know getting getting something out of it. But you know, um, I also you know it's kind of like I, I just remember looking at looking at uh you know going on one one of my bad 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 writing habits as as well as good reads is going on and looking at looking at how many books I sold this week and um and you know everything's shooting up right 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 around the time right after George Floyd's uh, murder, um and it's just like okay. You know, I'm I'm a, I'm a I'm a war profiteer now. You know. Oh no. Um, oh oh no. Oh. And yeah, and it's, uh, um, you know, um, so um, you know, I mean, I as a writer, I'm just as a writer, I'm just sort of taking in, you know, thinking about, you know, looking around, looking around, taking it in, um, you know, uh, and and seeing how it's going to be spit back out in the in the in the art. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So for me, what I will say is that, how do I put this? Like, I think what you just said was really sad, but it's true. It's like, for me, it's like, I'm thankful. The more Black authors people read, the better, you know? I remember it's funny because late last year, I made a tweet that said, you're not well read if all you read is white authors. And it blew up. And it's like, well, you're not. You know what I'm saying? Like, I retweeted it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're not. You're just not. But then it's funny because, you know, because I could be petty sometimes. And I I said, you know, I tweeted this about a month or two ago. And I said, when I wrote that, when I made that tweet, you know, people had feelings, of course, we know. But I was like, what other people are thinking that now? And I'm thinking about when you said war property, and I think about, like, it shouldn't take the death of somebody. Right for us to be of interest to the people that are living right alongside you, black people that are living. Um, and my thing is like, you should be reading black people all the time. But I think when we talk about with regards to history, history that we don't know, the lives that we don't know, the past and the present are, are just, they collide so many times because we're not taught to value black lives in this country and not just like actual living, breathing or walking on the street, but also just like, our stories, the stories that, that we document, the stories that we tell that are undocumented. And it's like, how do you make that sustainable when pe- Black people aren't being killed by the police, for lack of a better phrase? Right. Um, and another thing I wanted to talk about was there was a conversation at Spurn on that hashtag, rather, uh, which was publishing paid me. Um, if any of you are unfamiliar with that hashtag, um, it was talking about uh, basically contracts. <laughs> Uh, uh-huh. paid for their book deals um and it took off i was actually shocked at how many people talked you had people like nk jemison talk where she wasn't where i think if i'm not mistaken don't quote me on this she she was not paid six figures to, yeah for like her books and she's like she's like a she's pretty much a legendary sci-fi writer right now she's broken records right and you know, you'll see, for example, one white woman who got like 200K for her fiction debut. And then right. you hear about Jasmine Ward, who was Jasmine been, Ward, huh? That, what'd you say? That jumped out at me. She, yeah, you know, Jasmine she, Ward, for example. Jasmine Ward is the first woman to win the National Book Award for Fiction twice. Back to back, and yeah. She, she said that she had to fight to get to crack 100 thou. And so I wanted to get your thoughts on that too, because... I did notice that um, the author of Friday Black, if any of you know him, Nana, like he, he's a New York Times bestseller, short story collection. Because of that hashtag, he was able to advocate for more money. For oh, his, really? Yeah, I just thought he just wrote about it uh, this week. Okay, um, I didn't I see wanted, that, yeah. Yeah, so, but I wanted to get your thoughts on that too because here's the way I think about money. I just feel like I'm thankful that we have black brown people that talk about it, but I was I was happy, but I wanted to see more white people being upfront about the money that they make. Um, just in terms of like, you know, so we could really gauge, like, don't hide your hand when we're talking about publishing inequities. Yeah. Um, um I I will say for disclosure, like I did not participate in that because I was afraid of being seen as an exception. I didn't want to derail the conversation because it wasn't like, you know, my first book came out when I was 25. 
this book came out, you know, when I was 27, going on 28. And so, excuse me, 28, excuse me. Um, and I was, I had a leap in what was offered to me from the first second books, even though the second book is just part of a two book deal. And, you know, I was just wondering, like, what were your thoughts on, you know, as it was circling and whether you think it'll lead to change either? Yeah, when it was circulating, I, I looked at it with interest. I dipped in and out. Um, I was sort of distracted by other things at the time, but, but I, I dipped in. I, I dipped in and out. Um, and yeah, I saw I saw the things like Judgment Award. Uh, you know, uh, that one struck me, and I was just like, you know, she's well. What what hope do the rest of us have? If, you know, if, if our legendary author, <laughs> like a two-time National Book Award winner, a um, author genius. Time Magazine and Time right. Magazine by People of the Year 2018, like now contributing editor of Mandy Fear, like what? Right, and I and I didn't I, I didn't contribute as you know I didn't contribute to, to that hashtag, and I, I mean I, I don't I don't know why and, and but you know I think you know you know my first book I didn't really you know I just wanted to get my foot in the door and I was published by University Press and I you know I didn't get I didn't get very much at all you know as soon as I got the money it was it, it was gone um uh, and and. And you know, I did sort of a, a major leap after that, um, and I, you know, I his, you know, I, I just, you know, I, I think that you, we should, we need to get our, I, I love us getting our work out there, and I, and I think that we need to be fairly. I mean, it's going to sound bland. We need to be fair, fairly compensated, um, and you know, sort of, uh, you know, not, um, you know. <laughs> I'm always concerned about, uh, you know, ab ab about for, you know, exploitation, you know? Um, okay. And, um, you know, and, and I think that, um, I think that there are, um, I think that there, there's, I, I don't know, I hope it, I hope it may, I hope there are some changes that are, that are made. Um, I hope there's some changes that are made with the, um, you know, you know, with the, with the compensation. And uh, as long as we're, we're more open with it, that, you um, that that uh that things things can things can get moving okay all right <laughs> wish uh, i had a better answer for that yeah. uh, let's, let's jump into to the questions here yeah um uh so uh so uh here's here's, here's one that i that, that i think that that's a that's a good one morgan are, are there particular books of history that really opened your eyes to some of the erasures uh that we spoke about oh my god um, Jesus, like there's like the, the Sundown Towns book, I think it's by James Lowen, L-O-E-W-E-N. Um, that book was eye-opening. Um, I would say definitely, um, I would say the, like just what was on the PowerPoint, The Worth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, I would also, and, and for me, it's like, it's also like journal articles. Um, so I, I'm a huge history nerd, like in, on JSTOR, for example. So I'm thinking about, you know, articles that were written about like gangs in Los Angeles or about, you know, Cherokee Friedman, but particular books of history of uh, The Sweet Taste of His Liberty by Caleb McDaniel. He actually won the Pulitzer Prize for this one. Um, that's another one that I would I would recommend. Um, I said Wayward Lives, Beautiful Experience by Sadia Hartman is another one. Mm -hmm. um, and man, I'm trying to think of because that those are like this is not history in a sense. It's a memoir, but the Yellow House by Sarah Broom, where she talks about New Orleans and she's tracing her family for generations, and she's and she's also really good with the topography of the city. Um, those were really really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Oh, sorry, I had one more. I just forgot one. Um, <laughs> it's, it's another one um, called Water and African-American Memory. Since we were talking about water, it's a little bit academic, but that one, if you're interested um, in the way water is interpreted and experienced and with regards to the vestiges of slavery and all that, I would recommend that book too. Yeah, that, 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 part, of the, that part of your book really, um, really struck me. Yeah, that, that really, that, you know, that, it really had a lot of personal, personal, um, um, personal, personal connections. But uh, all right, so a uh, question: Not to get bogged down by labels, genre, but do we, do you see a difference between magical realism and the African supernatural as a way of conveying story? That's you, man. That's you. 
I think that's also you because you do uh, touch on the African American uh, spirituality. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but I, you know, I, it's a good question. I think that I think that it's not magical realism if you're writing about how people um, uh, experience their, their their spirituality. Spirituality is very very real to them. Um, and I, I, I think that um, I, I think we have to be very careful um, in, in writing um, about um, what we see as um, you know something that, that that's imagined and, and um, that's imagined and and how uh, how people are um, you know pe- you know people's uh, uh, spirituality uh, is, is is you know is, is experienced with them. Um, so, so I do think there's a there's a difference, and not not just not just African supernatural, but I think that um, I think that in you know there there are a lot of a lot of um, religious traditions um, where, for instance, the ancestors are very very alive um, uh, to to people, um, and um, and and that's and, and I don't think that's magical realism when you're writing it in that in that in that in that way. Yeah. You know, I, you know, nowadays I've been trying to think about my relationships to words and why some things seem pejorative when they don't have to be. So when I think of magical realism, I, I think of like hocus pocus, like woo, like things coming out from like the curtains, and I'm like, it doesn't always have to be that way, does it? And and maybe like the like I think of magic as pejorative or seen as like unreal or just not to be believed or, you know, not to be troubled with because of my own relationship. And maybe that needs to be need some unpacking. Um, it's hard because I do think black life is fantastic. And I don't mean it in a way that distance us from our community, but sometimes I hear black people talk and the way that they talk about these their stories, whether it's the cadence, the delivery, or just the, the you know, the way the mundaneness of it, but still it's fantastic. So it's very hard for me like to feel like there's a difference. I think that there's some type of interrelationship between the two. When I think of African supernatural, for example, it definitely feels like a lived experience mm-hmm. where, yeah. where magical realism is a category. And, right. and so for me, it's like sometimes we experience things that 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 and I think the African, I think. How do I put this? I think African supernatural can be a part of magical realism, but can also undermine it. So sometimes the constraints of what a category is or what a label is, um, and how and how, how this is done, I'm not exactly sure. It's almost like a thing where, where I read it, I, I can tell you. Like it's hard to see like what the constraints are, but I don't know. It's something I'm still working through, actually. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm always cognizant that I'm, I'm making up stuff, <laughs> you know, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm, I don't want to disrespect anyone who, who, uh, who, who is experiencing um, their spirituality. So, uh, you know, be very, you know, I'm very careful around, around those, those sort of things. Right. Um, let's see. Morgan, you talked early on in the book about how so much of the history you're trying to recover is lost or unremembered. You talked about this a little bit, but can you talk a, a more about how you go about excavating or reconstructing history when it's not out there to be found? Yeah, thanks for this question. Um, one of the things that I made sure I did was to let Black people talk. Um, and I knew early on that I might be able to find resources. So for example, um, when I went to the Low Country, before I went to Low Country, I made sure I did this every time before I traveled. I spoke to people before I traveled so they knew who I was. Um, and so one time a woman, a Gullah Geechee woman, uh, which is a sub-ethnic uh, African-American group. And she told me that this one island that was once dominated by Gullah people, on um, the remaining native islanders, they're being taxed 500% in one year. And I thought, oh, she's exaggerating. Then I found the New York Times article and it said, oh no, they th- that's true. Um, it's actually true. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I did, I, I worked in layers. I spoke to people. I gathered their stories with the help of a freelance transcriptionist, recorded, took pictures. Then I tried to find like JSTOR articles that can get me somewhere near the periphery of what they were talking about. I would also talk to scholars, many scholars, interviewing them just to get their thoughts on everything. But also, like what Rian said, I had to be a little speculative because with with regards to my own people, there's just stuff I'm not going to know 100%. 
But if I can get somewhere within the vicinity of the bullseye, I can make people realize that Black people aren't all lying. All these stories that we've passed down, there, there, there's, there's some type of truth in there. I don't know how big the kernel is, but there is a kernel. Um, so when I went about excavating this history, I went through different methods of oral history and documented history. And then also, with regards to writing about Black people, unfortunately, with people with descendants of enslaved Africans, you're going to hit these roadblocks, whether it's with mm -hmm. the whether it's with the lack of last names, whether it's with movement. Um, and I just decided to put up these educated guesses. I never wanted to be like, this is what happened firm because you just don't know, but it's okay to make these educated guesses based on the research that I did do. And I had to trust myself that I, that I worked my ass off to do the best I could with every single angle. Oh, here's the question for you, Rian. Can you talk about the robot stories in the world doesn't require you? They stick out from all the others, you know, non-robot characters. Where did they come from and how did you view their place in Cross River? So uh, I just, I don't know why, but for the longest, I just wanted to write a robot story. Uh, and, I, and I wrote the story, uh, The Electric Joy of Service, from an anthology um, called uh, Gigantic Gigantic World. And it was a, it was a, a, a science fiction anthology. And, um, but what I realized is that, you know, robot stories are very often slave stories, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the robots are very often servants and, uh, uh, and you know, look at, look, look at Star Wars and how uh, C-3PO is treated. Um, and, I, and, and, you know, you, you, you have a, you have a, you have a slave story. And I, and I, so I, so I, you know, I thought um, the character, his name is Little Nicky Jim. Um, he, uh, <laughs> it was an opportunity opportunity to uh to, to write about uh, i'll write about self-hatred and i think um and i think uh you know there's a there's a futuristic aspect to it but you know i think as, uh, the the vestiges of the past are are, are still are, are you know they run with us uh in the in, in the future so that's what i was i was really thinking about when i created that character but then i figured i i, I felt like i wasn't done with him <laughs> so i came back to, to him in a in a story where he and and his master um and and they, they they're both they both ha, you know are dealing with self hatred in in a way um they they have you know they create a a cyborg a woman a a, a woman and um and the master you know wants to use her um in uh you know as 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 a sex object and I you know and a lot of a lot of um of that story you know was was dealing with how um, Jim is, you know, Jim is sort of coming to 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 a certain awareness, um, and um, and and this woman has this awareness, and it was, and to me, it's it's sort of about, you know, how far can Jim go to, you know, to to, to help her um, when she needs when she needs it, um, and um, and and you know, and and uh, you know, how far can you know can can they both free themselves from this uh, from from this structure that they they've been they've been programmed under. Um, and you know how do I view their their place in Cross River? I think they 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 are you know they're just like a lot of the other characters in in Cross River in that they they are they are prisoners of history um, as we all are, uh, and um, in as, as futuristic and as 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 robotic <laughs> you know as, as non human as they are um, they, they're still subjects to you know to our very human history and our very human failings. Yeah. Um... Next question. Ah, so here's one, Morgan. You alluded to the dominant culture's obsession with facts and credible sources. How do writers and artists shift that? I think letting black people talk. Um, I think the thing is, it's like we have to be mindful of the fact that, with regards to marginalized people, who, for example, for example, with enslaved black people, where literacy was was a death was a death wish. You know, for example you may not have everything documented. That doesn't mean that anything is less true. Um, so I think when it comes to writers and artists shifting that, it's like really being able to take into account the, the significance of lore, the significance of intimate spaces, and to just keep talking about it and just knowing and just putting this history in a context in ways that could be consumed in many different ways. So textbooks, art like visual art song like i think if, if we can use that in many different angles that can help to shift or just not maybe can't shift it but combat it 
as best as we can. So as best as we can, so we can always be a part of the dialogue. Um, next one is writing is such an embodied process. I'm curious as to how you managed to write during COVID times, social unrest and the dailiness of being black in the US. How do you sustain yourself? Um, I Well, for me, I take a lot of naps. <laughs> I, rest is important. I have to tell myself the like this fight is gonna go on for a long time and I need to be here for that. And so I have to hold myself accountable with like taking my time more and just you know resting more. What about you, Rian? Yeah, I'm I'm you know, I, I don't I don't I'm not sure how to answer that question. I, I I sort of just figured it out uh this week, so I'm not sure if it works, but um here's what you don't do, right? You know, I, I had a project that I was working on, um, this novel that I that I alluded to. Um, which is which has been kicking my ass for years, um, but I you know I sort of dropped that and I was just like you know this, these times need to be documented. So I started um, I, I started a whole new another novel right uh, about you know that that sort of dealt with the times, um, but the times just moved so fast. You know it was satirical. Then they got the president. The president told us to drink bleach, <laughs> and I was like, well, I can't. You know I I can't I can't compete with that. Um, and it was you know it was just. You know, it, it was just so much and it was, it became very overwhelming um, because uh, everything was changing day in, day out. And um, some things I would make up, you know, I had an, I, I had an idea that, um, you know, when we started wearing masks that, I, that you know, you, people walked in stores and, and, and white people were wearing Klan masks. Um, and, and that was, that was a, a big, a big thing. Then that actually happened in real life. <laughs> so, um, so I, I decided that you know it's it's time to it's more of a time of observing than it is writing. Um, uh, so I went back to my other project, and I um, and that is still kicking my ass, and that's still overwhelming me. But I'm you know I'm taking it slow. You know, I, I, if I write a sentence a day, um, then I'm fine with that. You know, um, and that's and that's what I have been doing. I've been writing a sentence a day for the last couple of days, and 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 that's been that's been good. Okay, and then one last question, and then we'll close. Um, are there any other besides Edward P. Jones? Are there other underappreciated writers you wish more of us read? Yeah, I mentioned Gloria Naylor earlier. Um, you know, I got, I got a lot for that from her. Okay, um, I was gonna say Jesse Fawcett, um, Harlem Renaissance writer, probably one of the most prolific writers of that period. Um, and I, you know, hope she gets a really big resurgence, just like you know Zora Neale Hurston, for example. Um, so I would say that is another underappreciated writer that I wish more of us would read. Um, yeah, so I think we're I think we're good to go. Um, we're good to go. Yeah. We could go on longer, but <laughs> we could, we could. But this is a really great conversation. Um, I think where do we get in touch with now for this? Okay. Um, but yeah, thank you. I guess we just close and say, you know, thank you so much to everyone who joined us. Thank you so much for being in conversation with Rihanna and taking the time. Um, it was a really insightful um, and engrossing conversation. And um, I hope you all enjoyed uh, Rusty and I. And, and you know, Rihanna, I wish you the best of luck with your next novel and all the research and rabbit holes or lack thereof that come You as well. <laughs> thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. All right. Night. Bye. Black text on white background, New York Public Library Lion logo, 125 years. Learn more about the New York Public Library, nypl.org.